No deal. Donald Trump and King Jong-un walk away from their summit in Vietnam. So what went wrong? And where does it leave the nuclear threat from North Korea? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hoda Abdel Hamid. Sometimes you have to walk. This was how U.S. President Donald Trump described the sudden end to his summit with North Korea's leader, Kim Jong-un. The pair arrived in Vietnam with hopes of building on last year's historic summit in Singapore. But less than two days later, they signed no agreement and it's unclear when they'll talk again. North Korea's neighbors, South Korea and China, both said they were disappointed with the outcome. We'll bring in our panel in just a moment, but first, Wayne Hay reports from Hanoi. Before this summit, U.S. President Donald Trump tried to lower expectations of a deal with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. But the expectation was, at the very least, that the pair would sign some form of agreement on denuclearization or make a joint statement. Instead, the talks were cut short before lunch. The table was set, but the diners didn't show, leaving Donald Trump to explain why. Basically, uh, they wanted the sanctions lifted in their entirety, and we couldn't do that. They were willing to denuke a large portion of the areas that we wanted, but we couldn't give up all of the sanctions for that. The Americans said Kim Jong-un was willing to dismantle his Yongbyon research facility, regarded as the centerpiece of North Korea's nuclear program. In exchange, he wanted all economic sanctions lifted, which was a step too far for the U.S. Unfortunately, we didn't get all the way. We didn't get to something that, that ultimately made sense for the United States of America. I think Chairman Kim uh, was hopeful that we would. We asked him to do more. He, he, he was unprepared to do that, um, but I'm still optimistic. Despite that optimism, this was not how the summit was supposed to go. Earlier on Thursday, there was no sign of trouble ahead. Kim Jong-un, the reclusive leader of a repressive state, even answered questions from reporters, perhaps for the first time. Chairman Kim, are you ready to denuclearize? Kim Jong-un, you're ready to denuclearize. You're ready to denuclearize. If I'm not willing to do that, I won't be here right now. That's a good answer. Wow, that might be the best answer you've ever heard. But after two summits that have yielded very little, there are more questions than answers. Donald Trump warned about this possibility last year ahead of the first summit in Singapore, saying he was prepared to walk away if the talks weren't fruitful. It seems he's now delivered on that threat. But with such a sudden, premature end to this summit, there must be real concern about what happens next. At this stage, there are no plans for a third summit. Donald Trump says Kim Jong-un assured him there would be no resumption of missile or nuclear tests. But what happened in Vietnam has proved that this continues to be an unpredictable road to the stated goal of ridding North Korea of nuclear weapons. Wayne Hay, Al Jazeera, Hanoi. So let's bring in our guest. Joining us from Seoul is Se Wong Ku, publisher of Korea Exposé and former lecturer in Korean studies at Yale University. From Lancaster University in the UK, Associate Professor Robert Gucci, who is the editor of the book, The Trump Presidency, Journalism and Democracy. And in London, Emil Dahl, research fellow at the Royal United Services Institute and an expert in nuclear proliferation and sanctions policy. Gentlemen, well, thank you for joining us on the show today. Um, Robert Gucci, let me start with you. Uh, this is another bad headline for President Trump, but on a realistic side, maybe the expectations were a bit too high? Well, it's still unclear from an American perspective what the expectations were. He hasn't been very straightforward about exactly what these conversations um, should lead to. Uh, certainly, the first conference was a surprise. This wasn't something that was on uh, the agenda for most Americans. In fact, I think uh, most Americans enjoyed having North Korea as a very clear enemy. And now it's it's one where its, uh, it's relationship is, is quite... 
uh, it's quite unclear. And so uh, coming out of this with, with maybe slight, uh, you know, lower expectations for the White House uh, is still higher expectations uh, for most Americans who are, are confused about why these conversations are taking place. Well, Emil Dahl, I mean, there is certainly a completely different atmosphere than what we saw uh, last year in Singapore. And at the time, President uh, Trump was talking about a historical deal soon. Now he's saying no rush, no rush. Well, what happened this summit was that something needed to happen um, in order to proceed forward. Singapore was the first meeting between a sitting U.S. president and the leader of North Korea, and now is significant in itself. The summit that we've just uh, concluded now in Hanoi, it was really to work out what that looks like in practice. So North Korea has committed to denuclearization, but what are the actual steps? So I think the United States did have some objectives going into this summit. Um, the big question in the room was how much were they going to give up in, in, in um, in return for North Korean denuclearization. And that's probably where expectations didn't quite match up between North Korea and the United States. Well, say Wong Koo, um, we only have the American narrative on what exactly happened and why did these uh, talks break down. I mean, there was a table for lunch set up. The press corps was given a, a time for a signing ceremony, and then all of that got scrapped. But from where you are, how are people looking into what unfolded in Vietnam? Well, they're watching what have happened with shock and incredible sense of devastation, because we keep hearing this word expectation, and the expectation in South Korea certainly was very high. And many analysts were in agreement that there would be some kind of deal today. After all, as Mr. Kim Jong-un said, uh, he would not have traveled that far to not be sincere about denuclearization. And of course, um, no one really thought that there would be an amazing breakthrough today. Um, they did not think that we are going to see a um, statement about complete denuclearization with very concrete steps to support this uh, process. But at the very least, uh, some kind of a smaller deal would have been possible with uh, Mr. Kim uh, giving up at least the uh, Yongbyon nuclear facilities and, North and the U.S. Uh, reciprocating with some kind of reducing of sanctions, if not certainly all of them. But what was really surprising to many people here was how even that small deal was not possible in Hanoi after all this expectation and fanfare. Well, Robert, I mean, if we listen to President Trump, that small deal uh, was not possible because, as he put it, the uh, North Koreans were asking for a lifting of all the sanctions. Uh, we have to take it. We have to take it for his word because we haven't heard from the North Koreans. Do you think they were being too greedy or do you think they were just purposely putting a pause on these talks? Well, the United States, use, uh, you know, likes to use sanctions as a carrot and stick operation, and and one where uh, there are multiple uh, opportunities for further sanctions. So, uh, re removing them and applying them uh, almost uh, willy nilly when it comes to negotiation. If uh, if if President Trump didn't like everything that he was hearing, certainly, you know, he could remove one sanction and apply another one in its place. Uh, you know, these are these are diplomatic uh, moves that we see from from many uh, U.S. presidents uh, and the ability to, to walk in and say, you know, uh, let's start with a clean slate. Uh, let's be realistic, but, but start with, you know, s some sort of clean slate here uh, isn't going to be on any U.S. president agenda when it comes to uh, North Korea and when they have the ability to have the upper hand. Well, uh, Emil, I mean, the North Koreans also say that since the meeting in Singapore, they have taken a few st steps. They have, uh, for example, dismantled uh, a rock rocket engine testing site. They have also destroyed a, a major tunnel uh, that leads to a nuclear testing site. So may was, it a, was it maybe that they wanted to get something in return? So the, the moratorium on testing is, 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 of course, welcome. But I want to stress that what was outlined by Trump today, if that was, in fact, what was on the table, that is no small, small deal. The sanctions against North Korea 
are internationally agreed sanctions at the United Nations Security Council level. They've been built up steadily since 2006 in response to North Korean provocations. And they're now some of the most comprehensive sanctions packages that we've seen agreed at the UN Security Council level. So simply giving those up, no matter how much you get in return, is not a small deal. Um, I don't think that was ever going to be agreed today. Um, what uh, could have been done, perhaps, are limited exemptions or limited economic projects. Um, but I think that's a completely different um, area of sanctions lifting. And it's not sanctions relief, it's sanctions exemptions. Um, and that didn't seem to be um, what, was, what was being expected from the North Koreans in return. And Se Wong, uh, uh, the uh, sanction exemptions is something that South Korea would have welcomed, right? Absolutely. In fact, the uh, government here was very much prepared to uh, proceed with these uh, measures that would um, be what you might term uh, limited economic engagements, and they would have mainly consisted of restoring some of the joint ventures that were already in place before things started to get worse here in the Korean Peninsula. They would have included uh, reopening the industrial complex in Kaesong, restarting the tourism initiative on the East Coast, which allowed South Koreans to travel to North Korea at the time. Also, there have been talks about linking railways and roads through the DMZ so that there can be transportation of goods and people between the two Koreas. And these are the things that government was fully prepared to proceed with and implement. And now it's kind of end up with an egg on their face. So what, what are they going to do now? Because, I mean, the intra-Korean dialogue uh, was something that was going on at quite a, a pace and it seems much smoother than uh, the, the conversation between Kim Jong-un and President Trump, at least this time. Yes, so the relations between the two Koreas have become quite good, especially after almost a decade of tension under South Korea being ruled by the successive conservative administrations. And uh, Mr. Moon Jae-in, the president of South Korea, has put himself really in his own words as the driver of the Korean Peninsula. He said that he was confident he could make this work. He could influence what happens between North Korea and the U.S. And today, uh, it seemed to suggest that actually he does not have that leverage. Okay. And Emil, just going back to the sanctions, I mean, if you are Chairman Kim Jong-un, and you look just at recent history, you have examples of leaders, uh, the most recent being uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, who were pressed to abandon their, in that case, their chemical uh, weapons, in the case of Libya. And then look what happened uh, to him. No one came to help, and he was actually destroyed by NATO, which the U.S. is part of. Uh, we can look a bit further back also to what happened to Saddam Hussein, who gave up all of his uh, weapons of mass destruction. So Kim Jong-un must also be worried that if he gives up everything, what happens to him after that? No, that's exactly right. I think Kim Jong-un was in Hanoi to um, seek the boundaries for what a denuclearization agreement could look like. North Korea has nuclear weapons in a way, in a very simple way, um, to protect itself. Um, there are a myriad of reasons, but that's the key reason, to protect itself against perceived aggression from the United States and its allies in the region. So no, nuclear weapons plays a very important role in North Korea's foreign policy, and so does the sanctions. The sanctions that have been agreed against North Korea put uh, limitations, uh, quite strict limitations, on the amount of revenue that North Korea can uh, get from exporting certain commodities like coal or seafood or textiles. Uh, they're no longer able to host North Korean laborers abroad. That matters too. And Kim Jong-un has promised both security for his people, but he's also promised economic prosperity. And Perhaps it's become clear that you can't have economic prosperity if you are a country facing some of the most comprehensive sanctions packages and your total embargo of your economy. Uh, if you're facing that, economic prosperity is very difficult. So I think they are interested in a deal, but of course, they're not going to give up their nuclear weapons for nothing. They need some assurances from the United States, and that's going to take some wide changes to uh, the way that the United States operates in the region. And for me, I don't think that that's... Uh, currently something that the United States can even sign up to. Um, 
So it's interesting to see how this will proceed. Denuclearization should absolutely be something that we try and pursue, and President Trump is, is right to push for this and right to engage with, with North Korea. But I think actually on this, on this occasion, if things are as Donald Trump um, outlined them, sometimes walking away from a deal that would ultimately um, not be implemented in the way that you want it to, or you, you're not quite sure you've actually got a lot, enough assurances, maybe that is the better approach. Okay, and it's possible also that uh, the North Koreans uh, were thinking exactly the same thing, that they were not getting enough from their uh, point of view. Uh, Robert, in all of this, we have also the fact that President Trump has a lot of problems back home with the Cohen testimony and other things unfolding there. Is it maybe possible that the North Koreans put that into perspective? Uh, decided to wait and see how it will all uh, pan out and also are uh, maybe slightly worried because he is a president that changes his mind quite often. Well, certainly things are not good at home for, for Donald Trump uh, in the last two days, especially his former lawyer has been uh, very clear about uh, interactions he says he's had with Donald Trump that have uh, been possibly uh, illegal, certainly uh, in, in this uh, former lawyer's mind, racist and sexist. And so uh, he's not, you know, Donald Trump's not looking very presidential uh, at home. Uh, and so this, the, the North Korean uh, talks, certainly earlier in his administration, were an opportunity for him to uh, appear presidential on an international stage. Uh, these have been surprising talks, uh, things that, again, were not on the agenda for most uh, Americans or many of the lawmakers uh, back in the United States. And so this was an opportunity for Donald Trump perhaps to come out and say, look, I, I can uh, broker deals uh, with the worst of them, at least in the minds of uh, the United States uh, public. And uh, so this was an opportunity to to appear to, to be something that he, he isn't appearing to be uh, at home, certainly, today. Uh, and those uh, distractions, such as bringing in talks with North Korea and, and uh, his, his stance on Venezuela uh, and his uh, very loud and uh, very, very not-tempered uh, attitude, distracts from exactly what is going on in these uh, con congressional hallways uh, and, and conference rooms that are uh, appearing to put Donald Trump's presidency uh, in, in some sort of danger, certainly a second term. So, see, Wong, if we look at the whole region, um, Japan seemed to s indicate that it actually agreed uh, with the posi position of the Americans. Uh, China statement was quite bland, may I say. And, uh, and in South Korea, we do know that uh, President Trump had a phone conversation immediately after he left Hanoi with uh, President Moon. Uh, but was there any other reaction coming out? Well, we had a statement this afternoon from the presidential spokesperson Kim Il-gyum that um, the government here very much sees what happened in Hanoi actually as having been productive. It allowed the two sides to iterate to each other the precise positions that they're occupying. Of course, you could argue that this is spin but for South Korea, what really matters about this whole thing is not perhaps the minutia of denuclearization, although that is certainly important. What is important for people on the peninsula as a whole is peace. Um, whether you like it or not, things have become much better here in South Korea since 2017, when Mr. Kim Jong-un and Mr. Donald Trump were engaging in this war of rhetoric, and people actually fear there might be military conflict. And nobody will tell you that things are right now worse than what it used to be, and they want this process to move forward. The government wants the process to keep going, and that means to say that, yes, there is hope for the future, there's hope for more dialogue. And in fact, Mr. Trump today at the press conference did not completely kill off the possibility of further dialogue. And we are going to have to wait and see how North Korea reacts to this. But there's a strong chance that it too might stay the course and continue high-level discussion so that uh, maybe there will be another summit in the future. The big fear, however, is whether Mr. Trump really has more time in office given the kind of political troubles that he's having and whether um, if Democrats were to take power, um, this kind of mood for peace can actually last. Okay, well, Emil, President Trump somehow needs... Uh 
these talks to succeed because that would be his one major foreign policy achievement during his presidency. But one could also argue maybe that North Korea has all, no other choice as well, no other option uh, to improve its economy, to, to really start becoming part of the uh, international community. Well, you're right to point out that Trump has made this the cornerstone of his foreign policy. Um, we can assume that in about a year from now, he will be in his re-election campaign. And in a way, time has then run out for the North Koreans. If they want to agree to some kind of deal, it probably has to be done before Donald Trump goes too much into re-election mode, because we don't know if a democratic president would take the same approach to North Korea. Uh, part of the reason why we have a sitting US president willing to meet the North Korean leader is a personality like Donald Trump that shouldn't be understated. Then again, we've also had a lot of instability because of uh, tweeting and, and, and things like that. So in a way, the future is uncertain on what's going to happen. Um, and I think really the balls in, in North Korea's court, we haven't heard from them yet. We don't know why the talks broke down uh, or, or didn't go as planned um, from their perspective. So I think we need to wait and see what comes out from North Korean state media, what is their willingness to continue with this process, which is hugely important, as you point out, and something that the North Koreans do want to engage in, either to buy more time or actually to pursue denuclearization. That's something we have yet to, to fully clarify. Why are they, what's their true intentions for, for, for participating in this? Um, and then are they going to stick to things like not testing missiles um, in the next uh, few months? That will really be crucial for determining if there is another summit um, uh, that could be arranged in the near future. And then leading up to that summit, the behind the scenes uh, talks needs to be done clearly in a, in a, in a different way. I don't know what um, it, it went wrong, but, but having that surprise on the day of the summit uh, where you have a scheduled agreement signing, it uh, seems odd to me with the months of preparation that went into the summit. Um, I, again, I don't know what, what went wrong, but, but clearly uh, there needs to be a leveling of expectations between the United States and North Korea before a summit process is, is, is continued. Well, and, and Robert, let's assume there will be an, a third round of these talks sometimes in the future, maybe in a few months. Uh, in the meantime, um, do we expect um, probably China will have to play a role, which it has been doing quietly, uh, you know, even though even just merely allowing uh, the travels of Chairman Kim Jong-un through China to reach those summits. But it's certainly, do, you, do we expect Trump to lean a little bit on China and ask them, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to have a, a conversation with uh, Chairman Kim Jong-un? Well, it certainly would be nice to, to see uh, the, the president start to use uh, other countries in the region more publicly to, to engage in these types of uh, conversations. Um, but it's going to have to take him also sitting down in his seat and letting other leaders uh, have a little bit of a spotlight in, in making uh, uh, ways for, for peace and for, not, you know, and for nodding to them for, for that sort of effort. And uh, what, what we can't see is uh, Donald Trump going back to Twitter and going back to his microphones uh, ranting and raving uh, when something doesn't go the way that he likes or uh, responding immediately without putting out uh, some thought into what uh, what he's going to say. Uh, he doesn't uh, seem to play well with, with others when it comes to sharing the spotlight. And he's going to have to decide, is this really, uh, is this sort of peace relationship something that is pivotal for a second term? Uh, is it something that he wants to be remembered for? Are the lives of the people who live in these uh, regions uh, uh, worth the peace that he could uh, uh, hopefully broker? Or is this, uh, again, a distraction uh, or some sort of uh, play that he's, that he's making? And, and, you know, this far into the administration, we really can't tell if this is something he's absolutely serious about uh, or if this is something that uh, he's serious about to, to win a second term. Well, certainly his tone was very measured uh, during the press conference that he gave from Hanoi. Now he is flying back home, so I'm sure we'll hear more from him 
Chairman Kim Jong-un remains in Hanoi for a two-day state visit, but we have reached the end of this show. So thank you very much for joining me. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hoda Abdelhamid, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now. <laughs>